Welcome to What That Means with Camille. In this series, Camille asks top technical experts to explain, in plain English, commonly used terms in their field. Here is Camille Moorhart. I'm Camille Moorhart, host of In Technology Podcast, and today I have with me Vernetta Dorsey Winsong. Welcome to the podcast, Vernetta. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Vernetta is Director of Product Assurance Security Governance at Intel Corporation, and I've worked with her for a number of years now. Very impressed with her on personal and professional levels, so really looking forward to the conversation today. So define for us product security. Well, I guess you have to define product security before you define its governance, really. When people talk about cybersecurity, right, you you automatically think about networks, um, IT, defending your um, your network from malicious uh, acts and all of those good things. When we talk about product security, we're talking about what are the things that make up your network, right? You have devices, you, you have a computer, you have um, a server, you have all of these things. How we build those is product security, making sure that we dev- design them with security in mind, that we proactively use the use um, one open source versus another one because of better uh, security principles and understanding what are the potential threat actors. So product security is that development of your product with security in mind so that you build a better product that gets in that then gets put into those networks and things that from a cybersecurity you see people are protecting, right? Um, and then governance from an organizational perspective is we have a product security assurance program and we set certain requirements. We follow certain rules. We tell people, hey, please do this thing and not that. Um, and the governance of that, are we tracking the right things in industry? Are we tracking the right re- requirements, regulations? Are we have the right coverage? Um, you may have interviewed some folks who talk about different compliance aspects, maybe FIPS or SOC 2 or in different NIST regulations, right? So if these are things that we need to follow, are we following them? How are we following them? We, um, as Intel, you know, we created this thing called the security development lifecycle. And so we ask our people to, to follow this. The governance then says, okay, how do we track? How do we check and track that it is being followed? Is it effective? And if it's not effective, what do we do to make it better? How do we make improvements? How do we um, add things as the industry and the the landscape changes based on new threats? AI, we it's coming in on multiple levels. So how do we how do we look at that? What do, how do we use AI and how do we govern AI in our product? So um, the the landscape is always changing. So we also want to make sure that we're able to um, understand what it's going to take. So governance is what do you say you're going to do? Okay, are you doing that? And then how, um, how well, and what can you change, right? So um, we look at our um, SDL, screen development lifestyle, and then we also look at what requirements are we telling teams to do and have we done the right diligence on that? So it's kind of like an internal focus to our IPAS group and then an external focus to the execution of what we're asking people to do. Is it more of a sort of practices and processes that you monitor and track, or is it like the end result, end goal, end product. Do you have a measure for the product itself in the end, other than I suppose, does it get hacked, right? (laughs) Once it's out in the market. So it's both actually. So when you look at the practices and processes, so we have, you know, and on my team, we have an exception process. So we tell people, hey, you need to follow security development lifecycle because it has all these requirements based off of um, certain rules that you should apply based off your product or service, based off what you've said you're going to do, right? So if a team doesn't or can't meet a certain requirement, they have to get an exception. And so then we can track by our products and services, how many have exceptions, what type of exceptions they were. Cause sometimes you can say, I can't do it right now, but I'll fix it later. And then there's times you say, I won't be able to do it at all. So um, that's one factor. The other factor is that um, we look at um, assessments, a risk assessment in general of some of our products and services of how well they're doing. So to your point, like think about it from mergers and acquisitions. If we're going to acquire some company that already has an offering, some type of product offering out there, how do we know from a product security perspective that it's fitting into what we expect? So we do assessments on that and then have get well plans to get them to that place. So it's a little bit of both of 
of during the process of development and then after at the end there's assessments we can do to check how that how well it is in some senses you're kind of an auditor uh of what a product group is doing so who audits you so another great thing about a governance team is that i say that we should know where our holes are before anyone outside, whether it's Intel audit or another outside, if you get like a Deloitte and Touche or someone else, an outside audit agency. If you have a robust governance program, you should not get any surprises um, from any external body because you should have methods in place, things that you're tracking, um, engagements with your customers so you understand where the weaknesses are, what's going on to fix them. And then when you do get an external um, audit or review, you are able to know, shouldn't have any surprises. That's our goal. What advice do you have for, uh, maybe it's a smaller company or a new division in a bigger company trying to wrap their hands around governance for product security? Like, well, where do you start? From a product security perspective, if you want to make sure you have good governance, you want to make sure you have data in metrics. So as you as you build your capability, understand what are you building. So if you're if you're building out a requirement seat, maybe you're saying, okay, the first thing I can do as a small company is I can at least make sure that everybody understands what the requirements are as we build our products or services. And then you can monitor, you can monitor um, the usage of that tool, you know, from a requirement perspective. Um, you want to be able to monitor and um, observe how your your company or your your unit is um, using the uh, the using the requirements, but using the tools you're putting in place. So if you say, "Hey, I'm going to set with uh, I can build requirements. I can't control some of these other things, but I can control the requirement set." Then build metrics off that and track that. And then as you get that into control, then you can build another piece that you'll be able to use. So I would say take it piece by piece instead of trying to just do everything at once because that will overwhelm your teams and they won't be able to actually complete um, the goodness that you want them to. Um, when you're thinking about rolling out a new initiative or something, a new product, with governance, I, I say always thinking about the culture of your company, the communications, and the change that you're asking them to do because that will allow you to govern the process early on and not have to play catch up. And that's something that um, is useful in getting getting traction because governance is also, like you said, we do a lot of audits. We do a lot of reviews. People tend to think, oh, it's just compliance. But from a product security perspective, I believe that it's a way to enable a uh, faster time to market and faster, uh, better qualities of product. So I think you were alluding to this, but I want you to touch on it a little bit more explicitly. Like what are the areas when you're rolling something out and you're dealing with product groups that, I mean, no matter what the company, uh, they're trying to go fast and they're trying to get, you know, something competitive out in the market. Um, so what are the typical um, bottlenecks or roadblocks or issues you come up against? Or what are the areas where you have to say, okay, you know, here's the places that we could run into resistance or run into just challenges. I think a lot of it is mindset. Um, when you think about product security, a lot of people think that, don't think about it early enough. So training, uh, awareness of understanding of what's going on. Because when I talk to different developers, uh, kids in college, and I talk about, if you can think about what, what can someone do bad with your product, right? What's the worst they can do? And then design for that. Change, change your design so that you're eliminating that. Thinking about that differently in the beginning helps. That is probably the biggest bother because until people, until that light bulb, light bulb comes on for them, um, people think that it's just something that someone else is telling them to do. But once you understand that it's going to help you, help you, and it, it, it can either be a competitive advantage or just make sure you get the right product out the door without having lots of issues after you release it. Um, that change of mindset typically helps the most for me. Um, and then getting the right tools, understanding when you go a click down, what are you really trying to do? What is the, what is the way to um, track those metrics and use the tool that is the least intrusive to what you're doing? Don't just get the 
the tool that says we do all of your product security governance in one slot and it gives you all of this tech debt because you don't actually need all of those things. So go for the smallest piece that you need to make the biggest difference, monitor it, get your data, and then then go from there. Well, that makes me want to ask a question about automation and various tools that go into practices. Like, And I know I had you on a couple of years ago on Secure Development Lifecycle. So there is a podcast out there that talks about what is a secure development life cycle. And of course, Intel applies that on the hardware side as well as the software side. Can you automate various kinds of tools within a secure development life cycle? In any type of pipeline delivery, you can automate it, right? So if you have a continuous integration, continuous development software um, platform, um, and then there are some hardware aspects, not as much, but there are some things that you can put into your tool chain that will give you early warnings. And again, you can automate from a software side a lot. You can automate your requirements. You can automate your um, code check-ins. Um, you can automate the the responses to that as well. So you can track, again, from a governance perspective, I, wanted, I might want to know how many times do we have bad check-ins so, cause that might be an indicator that we need to ramp up our training or how, what do we do before uh, folks touch code, right? If we're seeing a lot of the stoppage of work because the check-in didn't go through because they had these types of errors. So the, the governance really, I think is really around data management, using that data to have informed decisions on what you need to tweak next or what's the, the thing that's in, um, hampering you the most. From a security development lifecycle perspective, we can pull data on um, what kind of projects are being registered based off of the survey. And then that can help us inform us, do we need to update any certain types of requirements? Are we seeing an uptick in these types of projects? This all helps, again, from a continuous improvement perspective to hone in on the areas that your your business may be focused on. So, because you don't want to do over, right? We don't have, no one has time for that, right? You want to focus on the, the piece that is going to give you the most return on your investment for your governance program. Do you see uh, governance programs in industry actually implementing AI as a part of that continuous improvement or AI to help them discover options for it? Yeah, that definitely is part of the conversation now because especially when I'm talking about data, I'm talking about um, analytics and anything that helps us go through data faster, more accurately, can learn um, with the assistance of some human glue just makes your program better. So that's definitely something that um, most programs are looking at if they haven't already started to dig into. One other question is, um, how do you get continuous uh, feedback from, like if you discover a problem with a product later that of course you missed, right? Or the process missed, <laughs> how should companies look at building that back into their processes? The learnings of where, first understanding where it came from, right? So if it's something that was missed and you should have found, right? You can then, you can analyze, oh, that we had a checker for this, but somehow I didn't pick this up. And you, you just have to do the retrospective from my perspective on that. And then you can update your requirements for your automation. Uh, sometimes what happens out in the field is something new. And then from, this is another thing, a reason to use AI, right? Because then you can add that into the learning model that, hey, this is something new. Um, from a security perspective, you're always going to have something new, um, something novel that we don't know about. But you want to rid the normal or the routine things that you can. And so um, we've done the, what we something like a key learning or something where you say, hey, what what are our misses? What is, what have what has been released out into the world and um that we could have prevented? And then you just you just have to go through this process of a, a retrospective to understand what part of the system failed. And because sometimes it's training, sometimes it's um miscommunication or so we need to clarify the requirement. And then other times it's, hey, we didn't this use case didn't actually exist in the space before, so we have to create that and, and plan for that. Um, I don't know if, if there's some automatic way. Uh, I still feel like that's a, a fairly human process, but but you need to have a process, and that's part of the governance. So you need to have a process to look at that because that becomes your self-improving mechanism that says you didn't just do something once and put it out there. 
you understand that it's a living environment that changes. How do you prevent uh, scope creep or governance creep? Like like you said, nobody has time uh, to do more than what's needed, and nobody has uh, nobody has time to not do what is needed, right? Because you don't want to have a, a, a problem hit the market that you could have solved. So how do you balance that? I mean, it seems like the more you know, the more governance there is, the bigger the process, the heavier the lift. So I'm just wondering how to address that. So part of that is making sure that, again, you're intercepting at the right time. There's a lot of things that happen if you wait too late and it gets really bloated. The reason when I mentioned before about designing with security in mind, if you can do it early on, and make it more of a pull than a push process. If my governance is more because people are asking what do they need to do differently and they're thinking about it, then it becomes less of that overhead piece. It, you, you, I see a lot of the bloatware, if you will, on governance because people either don't know so they get farther down the road and then they get hit with, um, you have to do all of these things, right, that, we, that we're tracking um, and they didn't know about it. Um, and so most people, if they can plan for it, then it's not, just like any pro- um, project management, right? If you can plan for it, it's not a it's not a big overhead because you're running through the system. Um, and then the other part to that is also just you have to set time for retrospectives, looking at what's working and what's not. You may have thought this would be a great governance ad to track this certain thing um, by causing people to do X, right? Uh, but if you don't, if not, if it's not providing any value, you're not getting real data out of it, then you have to cut that out. And so you have to have some type of process where you're looking at what you're doing. That's why I said there's two pieces. There's the there's the external to your customer, like where you're tracking that that work of of where you set the metrics up. And then you also have to make sure you're looking at why are we using this requirement? Why did the body that sets the requirement pick this? And do we need to change that? Right. And that's how you try to reduce the bloatware from what you were saying as well. My last question, what's what's your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job, actually, it is my team. I love my people. They do great work, and I love when they succeed. I love when they get kudos from my boss and my boss's boss because they just knocked it out of the box. And that, and when they, and it, and when it's because they push themselves, or I asked them to do something they didn't think they could do, and they nailed it. That's the best part of my job, and I love seeing people win because then we all win right everybody wins and and people are happy and that's really the best part of my job fernetta dorsey who is director of product security governance at intel thank you so much for joining us today thank you for having me never miss an episode of what that means with camille by following us here on youtube or search for in technology wherever you get your podcasts The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation.